Our scripture reading for this morning comes to us from the book Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be raised above the hills, all the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This cross was my grandfather's. He died when my mother was 12, so obviously I never got a chance to know him, but he was a Presbyterian minister and a chaplain in the Navy during World War II. And I love this cross. It is one of my most prized possessions. And it also has two candlesticks that go along with it. This is made out of brass shell casings. And he got it in the Pacific, as I mentioned, during World War II, and I couldn't bring the, um, the candlesticks with me in here because it's very, they're very heavy, and I didn't feel like I could carry them back and forth between services. But I love this cross. It is one of my most prized possessions, and it is because it reminds me of my grandfather and makes me feel close to him, but also because it reminds me of this scripture. And I have vivid memories when my grandmother, before she moved into her current assisted living facility, she would take this cross and the candlesticks down in her previous retirement home when her pastor would come to do communion. And this would be the cross and the candlesticks that would be set on the altar as they would receive communion from her pastor. And I just have very vivid memories of that. And so this is a very important, um, very important and near and dear to my heart because it reminds me of this scripture. The book of Isaiah begins with Isaiah prophesying against the wickedness of Judah. God is bringing a legal suit against God's people because they have not kept God's covenant. God says in chapter 1 that he has had enough with burnt offerings, but he has always wanted the people's hearts. God says, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Isaiah warns of the impending takeover by Assyria if God's people do not change their ways. The first chapter goes on, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land, but if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. Pretty clear, I think. God is going to send the nations to conquer Israel, and this will be a purifying fire for them. Throughout roughly the first half of the book of Isaiah, we see the Israelites making allegiances with nations in order to keep them safe, especially Babylon and Egypt. And God is angry about this because they are supposed to be trusting in God and their faith is to be in God and not the help that could possibly come from these other nations. So all of this, this background from Isaiah, presents a stark contrast to the image in chapter 2 that we just read about. And yet the reality of Jerusalem being destroyed and the promise of a new Jerusalem being established is repeated throughout the book of Isaiah. And each time that this contrast is presented, the new kingdom gets more and more filled out in what it will look like and what it will mean. Isaiah's message, overall, 
is one for all who are waiting for God to bring justice on violent oppression and replace it with God's kingdom of justice and peace and healing love. Our scripture tells us that Jerusalem will be exalted among, above all the nations, and all nations will come to it. All nations will want to know the will of God and will wish to be instructed in it. God's word or God's law is not the exclusive right of any particular group of people, but is spoken for all to hear from the mountain of God. God will judge the nations. God will be the mediator of any conflict that takes place. And the people, in response, will turn their weapons of war into tools of well-being and community building. Can you imagine what God would have to say to us so that we might turn our weapons of war into weapons of community building? Or not weapons of community building, tools of community building? The nations will no longer spend their energy learning war because they will spend their time learning and following the instructions of God. War won't even be in their vocabulary after a generation or so since they will no longer teach it. Can you imagine? This is a picture of the world in which God intended for us to live. A world where natural elements of our lives are not used to destroy or kill, but are used to sow and reap. The things that make for an abundant life. The invitation for us to come to where God dwells, to walk and learn, to trade our implements of destruction for tools of life, is here given to us. Now this scripture, when I read it for preparing for this sermon, it made me think of a really wonderful movie called Miss Congeniality. Maybe you've seen it. And there's a scene in this movie, for those of you who need a recap, Sandra Bullock is an FBI agent who is not very ladylike, not very pageant-like, but there is a threat to this pageant, and so she has to go undercover. And she has to make it to the finals in this pageant because something's going to happen they suspect on the last night of the pageant. And so her coach, who is the most patient person, obviously having to work with her, um, is um, telling her what she needs to say. And the question that she's going to be asked is what is needed most in society? And he tells her that she's supposed to say world peace. And so the scene comes and all of these other women are answering the question and they all say world peace and everybody chants and cheers, you know, and, and is excited about that. And then when she gets up, what does she say? She says, that would be harsher punishment for parole violators, Stan. And then everybody's quiet. And then she says, and world peace through her teeth, you know, because she's very, I'm being kind of sarcastic at that point. We all say that we want world peace, right? We know that it is the right answer to give. But do we believe that it can really happen? Are we willing to take steps within our own hearts, our own families, our own communities to be peaceful people? Confession time, when I read this scripture for today, I couldn't imagine it actually coming to be. I was like, yeah, right, we are too far gone for this image to ever become a reality in our world as we know it. When I think about everything going on in our world, this seems to be nothing more than a pipe dream. It seems impossible. One person said, these words are hard to believe because we have been disappointed so many times by failed peace treaties, divisions in our own societies, fractured relationships within our own lives. We know firsthand the destruction that conflict inflicts, even if we have never lifted an actual sword. But I wanted to put this image before us today. And fun fact, this scripture is actually assigned to the first Sunday of Advent, which if you know anything about the Christian year, the first Sunday of Advent is the first Sunday of the Christian year. So this is one of the first scriptures as we begin a new Christian year that you might hear in church. And we know that in the season of Advent, we're awaiting Christ's birth, but we're also waiting for Christ to return, right, and restore and make all things as God intended them to be. But I didn't think we could wait until Advent. I wanted to put this image in our minds today. Because I think that we are much much less likely to believe this vision is possible if we don't keep it in our minds. 
I'm not going to get all power of positive thinking on you or anything today, but the ability to visualize an outcome is an important skill to have. Think about in your own life when you've thought about your career and you've thought five years down the road, here's where I want to be, or this is what I want my life to look like, my family to look like in five to ten years. When we set those images in our minds of what we want something to look like, we have a better chance of organizing our steps to get to that goal, right? But if we don't have that plan, then we are much less likely to reach whatever it is that we desire. And so I want to keep this scripture before us because if this is truly the world that God intends, then we need to keep this in our minds. And whenever we watch the news, we need to then go and read this, right, to remind us that that God is not done with the world. I think one of the problems when it comes to thinking ahead or visualizing is that if you're anything like me, you spend all your time and energy thinking about the future and you're thinking about the worst possible outcomes. Thankfully for us, This vision that Isaiah has is brought back to real time with the last verse. Walk in the light of the Lord. It is Isaiah's way of telling us to eat the elephant one bite at a time. Here's the vision and now take steps with God's help to make this vision a reality. Those who live in the presence of God, that's us, are admonished to take the first steps on the path that all nations will one day tread. The time of this vision is vague. We don't know exactly when this reality will come to pass, but the call to action is not vague. It is clear. Walk step by step in the light. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, the reign of God is not something that's just a future promise. We're not only talking about when we get to heaven, when we talk about the kingdom or the reign of God, but it's also a present reality. And the church has a special role in ushering in this reign of God. And this image gives us a picture of what that is to look like. And if this image gives us any hope at all, then we must participate in the work to make it a reality. But maybe as you heard this scripture, maybe part of the reason why it's so hard to believe is because you thought, well, if only that group of people or that nation or that person would heed the Lord's instruction, this would all be possible. But we cannot let ourselves think that we are not also included in those who need to heed the word of the Lord and God's instruction. While we may not commit physical acts of violence against another, we certainly can have hearts that are at war. How often do we heed the Lord's instruction? Do we even know what the Lord's instruction is? How often do we want to take justice into our own hands and think we know better than God what needs to happen or what should happen? How often do we sow seeds of division and hate instead of sowing seeds of unity and love? There's a book that's called Anatomy of Peace, and this is actually a book that one of our Sunday school classes just read, and so um, I got to kind of read through it as my husband was reading it. Um, But it's also a book that our bishop, Bishop Sue, has suggested a few years ago that all clergy and all people in our conference read. So if you're looking for something to read, The Anatomy of Peace is a great book. And it talks about having a heart at peace versus having a heart at war. Now the bad thing about my husband having just read this book uh, more recently than I is that I'll do something or say something and he'll be like, seems like your heart's at war. (laughs) Thanks a lot, hon. But anyway, that's beside the point. (laughs) Anyway, in this book, A heart at war is defined as one in which we see others as objects. Others are obstacles or vehicles to get what we want. And if our hearts are at peace, then we recognize others as people that have hopes and needs and cares and fears as real as our own and as valid as our own. We want what is best for them. We want them to succeed and thrive. And this is when the work of cultivating community begins. It will not be until we as individuals have hearts at peace that we can see nations at peace. 
And as cliche as it sounds, it truly does begin with us in our own hearts. If I'm honest, my husband has been right sometimes when he said that my heart is not at peace. Consciously, of course, I, I do not think that people are objects. Don't worry, I'm not there. But I feel that we have become desensitized to the pain and struggles of those around us. What I see in the world, in many places, is a lack of empathy. We have compassion fatigue. Or maybe we just feel paralyzed when we think about how much is wrong in the world and how can we, as seemingly insignificant beings, do anything about it. All of these things can no doubt lead to us having our hearts at war. One example, I'm in a Facebook group. Um, and it's full of moms. And usually this group is, you know, asking questions about, is this normal for my three-year-old to be doing this? Or where's the best place to get your hair done? Things like that that are fairly benign. But as is the case in many places, there have been recent discussions about masks. And they have turned so ugly. And what surprises me is not that we have differences of opinion about things because we, we're always going to have those. There will always be conflict in the world. But it is how much there's a lack of empathy. There is a total lack of empathy or desire to know what someone else's experience truly is. And here is the scarier part. I see these comments and I see these threads on Facebook and I don't comment on them, but I will read them. And I will say, let me get some popcorn because it is about to go down and this is exciting and there's something about it that just gets me really worked up. And maybe you feel that way too. There's something about just getting mad or worked up about something that makes us, I don't know, I don't know what it is. But, um, but that shows that my heart is not at peace. That shows that there's something in my nature, in our nature, that likes conflict, that likes to get involved in it because it riles us up. I need this image from Isaiah chapter 2 today. We need this image from Isaiah chapter 2 today. I need to be reminded of God's ultimate plan for creation, one of justice, peace, and restoration. So my question for us today, and as we go throughout this week, let's think about the things that we are doing and saying. And are these things bringing us closer to this reality, or are they making this reality even harder to envision or imagine? As followers of Christ, we have the responsibility to hear God's instruction and to live in peaceful ways, trusting that God will ultimately make everything right. This scripture gives us confidence that the future belongs to God, which can give us hope in the present. One person put it this way, we are in the presence of a mystery. We don't know when or how, but we can know that this is what God is seeking to do in our world. It is what Jesus meant by the reign of God, which is already present and at work among us though obviously not yet in fullness. Jesus ushered it in. We see it in Jesus who converted fear to love, lunacy to sanity, enemies to friends. He died surrounded by swords. A spear stabbed him. Nails tore him. They entered infinite love, which melted them into light. There is power in walking in God's light here and now, one step at a time. Maybe you feel cynical or hopeless that this world could ever truly exist. But there is enormous and practical power in taking steps towards this goal. The future belongs to God. God's plan for us has never changed. But the steps toward that future belong to those of us who have glimpsed God's light and who trust that as we take these steps, there will be enough light along the way. So let us walk in the light and be cultivators of a garden 
of peace and justice. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this time to see again your vision for, for the world. God, I pray that as we go throughout our week, that when we turn on the news and we see all of the things that are going on around us, that we will not give up hope, that we will keep this image, this image of Isaiah's in our mind as well, so that we will not give up, that we will know that there is power in being people of peace. Break our hearts, O oh God. Help us have hearts that are truly at peace within us, because it is then and only then that we may see the world transformed. We trust you and we love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.